The League of Nations was established with three main constitutional organs, the Assembly, the Council, the Permanent Secretariat. The two essential wings of the League were the Permanent Court of International Justice and the International Labour Organization. The relations between the Assembly and the Council were not explicitly defined, and their competencies, with a few exceptions, were much the same. Each body might deal with any matter within the sphere of competence of the League or affecting the peace in the world. Particular questions or tasks might be referred either to the Council or the Assembly. Reference might be passed on from one body to another. Topic. Constitutional organs Topic. Permanent Secretariat The Permanent Secretariat, established at the seat of the League at Geneva, comprised a body of experts in various spheres under the direction of the General Secretary. Topic. Organization The principal sections of the Secretariat were, political, financial and economics, communications and transit, minorities and administration SAR and Danzig, mandates, disarmament, health, social opium and traffic in women and children, intellectual cooperation and international bureau, legal, and information. Each section was responsible for all official secretarial work related to its particular subject and prepared and organized all meetings and conferences held in that connection. Topic. Competencies The staff of the League's Secretariat was responsible for preparing the agenda for the Council and Assembly and publishing reports of the meetings and other routine matters, effectively acting as the civil service for the League. The Secretariat was often considered to be too small to handle all of the League's administrative affairs. For example, the total number of officials classed as members of the Secretariat was 75 in September 1924. The total staff, including all the clerical services, comprised about 400 persons. Topic. Classification and distribution of documents In general, the League documents may be classified into the following categories, document on public sale, documents not on public sale, and classified, e.g., confidential and secret. The specific feature of the documents emanating from the League of Nations was their classification according to the persons they were addressed to and not according to their subjects. Topic. General indications Topic. Assembly The Assembly consisted of representatives of all members of the League. Each state was allowed up to three representatives and one vote. The Assembly had its sessions at Geneva and met on yearly basis on the first Monday of September according to the Rules of Procedure of the Assembly, adopted at its 11th meeting, 30 November 1920. A special session of the Assembly might be summoned at the request of a member, provided a majority of the members concurred. The special functions of the Assembly included the admission of new members, the periodical election on non-permanent members of the Council, the election with the Council of the Judges of the Permanent Court, and the control of the budget. In practice the Assembly had become the general directing force of League activities. Topic. Organization of the First Assembly The plenary meetings of the First Assembly were held from 15 November to 18 December in Geneva, Switzerland. At the opening session, there were 41 states out of 42 member states. Six states were admitted during the meetings and consequently were represented during the session Albania, Austria, Bulgaria, Costa Rica, Finland and Luxembourg. In total, 31 plenary meetings were held. 
The principal questions during the first session were, organization of the Secretariat, establishment of a new organization to deal with health question, new organism to deal with communication and transit, and a new economic and financial organization, admission of new member states, relations between the Council and the Assembly, nomination of the non-permanent members of the Council, establishment of the Permanent Court of International Justice, the first and second budgets of the League, conflict between Poland and Soviet Russia, repatriation creation of prisoners of war, etc. Topic. President He M. Paul Hymans, Belgium Topic. Honorary President M. Giuseppe Mata, Switzerland Topic. Vice Presidents elected by the Assembly The Assembly at its fifth plenary meeting elected the six Vice Presidents. Thirty-nine states have taken part in the ballot, so the required majority was 20 votes. The sixth Vice President was elected at a second ballot with 22 votes. Topic. Vice Presidents ex officio as Chairman of the Committees The Right Honourable Arthur Balfour, British Empire He M. Tommaso Titoni, Italy He M. Léon Bourgeois, France He M. José María Quiñones de Leon, Spain He M. Antonio Hunius Gana, Chile He M. Hallmar Branting, Sweden Topic. The Secretary General of the League The Honorable. Sir Eric Drummond The General Committee of the Assembly was constituted of the President and the Twelve Vice Presidents with Sir Eric Drummond, the Secretary General. Topic. Committee No. 1 Constitutional Questions Chairman, the Right Hun. A. J. Balfour, British Empire. Topic. Committee No. 2 Technical Organizations Chairman, H. E. M. Titoni, Italy. Topic. Committee No. 3 Permanent Court of International Justice Chairman, H. E. M. Léon Bourgeois, France Topic. Committee No. 4 Organization of the Secretariat and Finances of the League Chairman, H. E. M. Quinones de Léon, Spain Topic. Committee No. 5 Admission of new members into the League Chairman, H. E. M. Hunius Gana, Chile Topic. Committee No. 6 Mandates questions, armaments, and the economic weapon Chairman, H. E. M. Branting, Sweden Topic. Council The League Council acted as a type of executive body directing the Assembly's business. The Council began with four permanent members the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Japan and four non-permanent members which were elected by the Assembly for a three-year period. The first four non-permanent members were Belgium, Brazil, Greece and Spain. The United States was meant to be the fifth permanent member, but the U.S. Senate voted on 19 March 1920 against the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles, thus preventing American participation in the League. Topic. List of Council Sessions, 1920 
The first session of the Council was held in Paris at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on 16 January 1920. The following members of the League were represented, Belgium, Brazil, the British Empire, France, Greece, Italy, Japan, and Spain. The French representative, Mr. Léon Bourgeois, was elected as the first chairman of the Council. The second session of the Council was held in London at St. James's Palace on the 11th of February 1920. The following members of the League were represented, Belgium, Brazil, the British Empire, France, Greece, Italy, Japan, and Spain. The British Empire was represented by the Right Honourable A. J. Balfour, who was elected as President. The Secretary General of the League, Sir Eric Drummond, was also present, and assisted in the preparation of the agenda and relevant documents. The third session of the Council was held at the Quai d'Orsay in Paris on 13 March 1920. The following members of the League were represented, Belgium, Brazil, the British Empire, France, Greece, Italy, Japan, and Spain. In accordance with Art. V of the Covenant, M. Zamoyski, Ambassador of Poland in Paris, sat as a member during the discussion concerning Poland, namely the typhus in Poland. The fourth session of the Council was held at the Palais du Petit Luxembourg in Paris on 9-11 April 1920. The following members of the League were represented, Belgium, Brazil, the British Empire, France, Greece, Italy, Japan, and Spain. The main issues discussed were, the status of Armenia, the protection of minorities in Turkey, the repatriation of prisoners of war in Siberia, and the question of Danzig. The fifth session of the Council was held at the Palazzo Chiga in Rome on 15 May 1920. The president of the session was the Italian representative, Mr. Titoni. The main issues discussed were, the traffic in women and children, the question of Eupin and Malmedy, prevention of disease in Central Europe, the International Committee of Jurists, and the prisoners in Siberia. The second public meeting was held at the Capitol on 19 May 1920. Topic. Permanent members of the Council Topic. Non-permanent members of the Council The number of non-permanent members of the Council was set at four by Art 4, para I of the Covenant. They were to be selected by the Assembly from time to time at its discretion. The number of non-permanent members of the Council was increased from four to six by Assembly Resolution of 25 September 1922. In 1926 the membership was further increased to nine. In 1933 the number of nonpermanent seats on the council was provisionally increased from nine to ten. A further increase to eleven was approved by the Assembly in 1936. <laughs> List of states nonpermanent members of the council Topic. Unanimity rule Unanimity was required for the decisions of both the Assembly and the Council, except in matters of procedure and some other specific cases, such as the admission of new members. This general regulation concerning unanimity was the recognition of national sovereignty. The League sought solution by consent and not by dictation. However, in case of the dispute, the consent of the parties to the dispute was not required for unanimity. Where the reference of a dispute was made to the Assembly, a decision required the consent of the majority only of the Assembly, but including all the members of the Council. Topic. Other bodies The Covenant implied the establishment of auxiliary bodies for various questions of a more or less technical character. The League oversaw the Permanent Court of International Justice, the International Labour Organization and several other agencies and commissions created to deal with pressing international problems. 
These included the Disarmament Commission, the Health Organization, the Mandates Commission, the International Commission on Intellectual Cooperation precursor to UNESCO, the Permanent Central Opium Board, the Commission for Refugees, and the Slavery Commission. Several of these institutions were transferred to the United Nations after the Second World War, the International Labour Organization, the Permanent Court of International Justice as the International Court of Justice, and the Health Organization restructured as the World Health Organization all became UN institutions. Topic. Permanent Court of International Justice The Permanent Court of International Justice was provided for by the Covenant, but not established by it. The Council and Assembly established its constitution. Its judges were elected by the Council and Assembly, and its budget was provided by the Assembly. The composition of the Court was of eleven judges and four deputy judges, elected for nine years. The Court had been competent to hear and to determine any international dispute which the parties concerned submitted to it. The court might also give an advisory opinion upon any dispute or question referred to it by the council or the assembly. The court was open to all the nations of the world under certain broad conditions. Questions of fact as well as questions of law might be submitted. Topic: <laughs> International Labour Organization. The International Labour Organization was created in 1919 on the basis of Part 13 of the Treaty of Versailles and became part of the League's operations. The ILO, although having the same members as the League and subjected to the budget control of the Assembly, was an autonomous organization with its own governing body, its own general conference and its own secretariat. Its constitution was different from that of the League. Representation had been accorded not only to governments but to representatives of employers and workers' organizations. Topic: <laughs> Organizations arising from the Covenant. The Covenant left a broad discretion to the Council and the Assembly in constituting the auxiliary organs. The accomplishment of the numerous tasks delegated to the League necessitated the creation of two main types of auxiliary bodies Technical organizations dealing with finance and economics, transit, and health, and Advisory committees, dealing with military questions, disarmament, mandates, traffic in women and children, intellectual cooperation etc. Topic. Health Organization The League's Health Organization had three bodies, a Health Bureau, containing permanent officials of the League, an Executive Section the General Advisory Council or Conference consisting of medical experts, and a Health Committee. The Committee's purpose was to conduct inquiries, oversee the operation of the League's health work, and get work ready to be presented to the Council. This body focused on ending leprosy, malaria and yellow fever, the latter two by starting an international campaign to exterminate mosquitoes. The health organization also worked successfully with the government of the Soviet Union to prevent typhus epidemics including organizing a large education campaign about the disease. Topic. Permanent Mandates Commission. Since the beginning of its work, the League has been called upon, as one of its political, administrative and humanitarian duties, to exercise a sort of indirect guardianship over certain people not yet able to stand by themselves. Indeed, the Art. 22 of the Covenant entrusted the mandate to administer these territories to advanced nations who can best undertake this responsibility. The principle of the well-being and development was to be the guideline of all the powers governing native people various mandates the mandate commission supervision and execution of the mandates results of the mandate system topic economic and financial organization 
After the end of the war, the economic and financial conditions in all European countries were close to total collapse. Within this context, the League organized a large conference in Brussels in September to October 1920. The goal was to find a solution to monetary problems and facilitate the circulation of goods and funds. Following the conference the League established an economic and financial organization, including several committees financial, economic, fiscal, statistical. During the following years the League assisted many European countries, Austria, Hungary, Greece, Bulgaria, etc. The Fiscal Committee discussed several general issues related to double taxation and tax evasion. The works of the Economic Committee comprise the treatment of foreign nationals and enterprises, abolition of the prohibition and restrictions on imports and exports, unification of customs nomenclature, bill of exchange, unification of statistical methods, trade policy, veterinary medicines, international industrial agreements, problems of coal, sugar problems, issue of smuggling in general and alcohol, in particular, and indirect protectionism. In October 1929 the Great Depression started in the U.S. and soon contaminated Europe. In 1933, the Lawn organized a new economic conference in London to find a common solution to the protection of national economies. The conflict between the international political goals of the major powers and their views on economic welfare prevented from any concerted solution. Topic. Transit, transport and communications The rapid growth in communications and transit, by land, sea and air, has led to rapidly expanding technical activities of the League regarding those issues. The introduction of mass production systems organized into assembly lines and based on standardized models, hugely contributed to the development of transport and communications. The LAN created its Organization for Communication and Transit in 1921. Its general conference included all member states while the committee had 18 members. The conferences of Barcelona 1921, and Geneva 1923 concluded with conventions on the international regulation of maritime ports, waterways, and railroads. Technical assistance was provided to member states as well as help with arbitration disputes concerning transit. The Organization for Communication and Transit accomplished useful works and made laws that will be retained in the future work of the United Nations. Topic. International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation The League of Nations had devoted serious attention to the question of international intellectual cooperation since its creation. The First Assembly December 1920 recommended that the Council should take action aiming at international organization of intellectual work. The Council adopted report presented by the Fifth Committee of the Second Assembly and invited a Distinguished Committee on Intellectual Cooperation to meet in Geneva, August 1922. The program of work of the committee included, enquiry into the conditions of intellectual life, assistance to countries whose intellectual life was endangered, creation of national committees for intellectual cooperation, cooperation with international intellectual organizations, protection of intellectual property, inter-university cooperation, coordination of bibliographical work and international interchange of publications, and international cooperation in archaeological research. The International Commission for Intellectual Cooperation was created in 1922. Its first president, Henri Bergson, participated together with many distinguished people in improving conditions of intellectual workers and facilitating contacts. From 1926 the commission was included in the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation, established in Paris. The cinema was also considered as a useful tool to bring minds together. The International Educational Cinematographic Institute was created in Roma after a proposal from the Italian government and placed under the League's supervision. Although serving under a fascist government, it carried out considerable work promoting the peaceful ideal and the spirit of international cooperation. Topic. Permanent Central Opium Board 
The supervision of the traffic in opium and other dangerous drugs may be considered as one of the most important social and humanitarian activity of the League. Before the creation of the League, there existed an international convention, the Hague Convention of 1912 that never entered into force. The signatories of the Treaty of Versailles agreed by Art. 295 to ratify it, ipso facto. The convention imposed, for the first time, certain obligations for regulating the trade in and production of drugs, on the contracting parties. The League appointed an advisory committee of experts, and instructed the Secretariat to collect full information on the steps taken to apply the 1912 Convention. The Geneva Convention of 1925 supplemented and extended that of The Hague. It rendered the import certificates compulsory, and provided for more effective supervision of production and international trade. The Convention further provided for the setting up of a permanent Central Opium Board. The board was set up in 1928, and built up the international system of control. In 1931 the Assembly summoned a conference that deliberated in favor of limiting the national manufacturing of narcotics as the only way to make sure that no margin was left for illicit traffic. <laughs> Topic. Advisory Committee on the Traffic in Women and Children The rapid development of international transport during the 19th century, not only increased the number of emigrants, but also enabled traffickers of women to organize their despicable trade on more ambitious, almost worldwide lines. By 1910 the states undertook to punish traffickers, even if they had committed offenses in other countries. The League joined its efforts to those of private organizations and governments. An enquiry was held and the League set to work to secure an extension of state obligations. In 1921 a convention was adopted strengthening the measures against trafficking. The Committee on the Traffic in Women and Children was created. The annual reports of governments, combined with those of big private organizations working on parallel lines, enabled the Committee to carry on its work of coordination and supervision. Topic. Slavery Commission The League has considered the problem of slavery and set about securing information from various governments since 1922. Few years later, a convention was drawn up in view of hastening the total abolition of slavery and the slave trade. The Slavery Convention of 25 September 1926 produced good results in many territories. In 1932, in the League Review of the Convention Implementation, appeared that cases of capture of free men still occurred in some areas, and that slave markets existed in several countries. The Assembly decided therefore to appoint a permanent advisory committee to study the facts and the institutions related to slavery, and to consider means of eliminating them. Topic. Commission for Refugees. In 1921 they helped to assist the approximately 1.5 million people who fled the Russian Revolution of 1917. In April 1920, there were more than half a million prisoners of war, most of them in Russia, waiting to be repatriated in extremely bad conditions. The Council of the League asked the famous explorer from Norway, Fridtjof Nansen to examine the situation. Nansen took immediate steps and in less than two years managed to repatriate more than 427,000 prisoners of war to 26 different countries. The League established a commission for refugees in 1921 and Nansen was the first High Commissioner. In autumn 1922 Fridtjof Nansen was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The commission also established the Nansen passport as a means of identification for stateless peoples. Topic. Disarmament Commission The Conference for the Reduction and Limitation of Armaments of 1932-1934 sometimes World Disarmament Conference or Geneva Disarmament Conference was an effort by member states of the League of Nations, together with the U.S., to actualize the ideology of disarmament. 
It took place in the Swiss city of Geneva, ostensibly between 1930 and 1934, but more correctly until May 1937. The first effort at international arms limitation was made at the Hague Conferences of 1899 and 1907, which had failed in their primary objective. Although many contemporary commentators and Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles had blamed the outbreak of the First World War on the war guilt of Germany, historians writing in the 1930s began to emphasize the fast-paced arms race preceding 1914. Further, all the major powers except the U.S. had committed themselves to disarmament in both the Treaty of Versailles and the Covenant of the League of Nations. A substantial international non-governmental campaign to promote disarmament also developed in the 1920s and early 1930s. A preparatory commission was initiated by the League in 1925. By 1931, there was sufficient support to hold a conference, which duly began under the chairmanship of former British Foreign Secretary Arthur Henderson. The motivation behind the talks can be summed up by an extract from the message President Franklin D. Roosevelt sent to the conference. If all nations will agree wholly to eliminate from possession and use the weapons which make possible a successful attack, defenses automatically will become impregnable and the frontiers and independence of every nation will become secure. The talks were beset by a number of difficulties from the outset. Among these were disagreements over what constituted offensive and defensive weapons, and the polarization of France and Germany. The increasingly military-minded German governments could see no reason why their country could not enjoy the same level of armaments as other powers, especially France. The French, for their part, were equally insistent that German military inferiority was their only insurance from future conflict as serious as they had endured in the First World War. As for the British and U.S. governments, they were unprepared to offer the additional security commitments that France requested in exchange for limitation of French armaments. The talks broke down and Hitler withdrew Germany from both the Conference and the League of Nations in October 1933. The 1930s had proved far too self-interested an international period to accommodate multilateral action in favor of pacifism. Topic. Committee for the Study of the Legal Status of Women In 1935, the League of Nations Assembly decided to conduct a study of women's legal status around the world as a response to pressure by women's organizations pressing for an international treaty of women's equal rights. The Assembly resolved to consider how the terms of the Equal Rights Treaty should be examined in relation to existing political, civil and economic status of women under the laws of countries around the world. To conduct this study, the Committee for the Study of the Legal Status of Women was appointed to design a questionnaire to submit to three scientific institutes, the Institut de Droit Comparé and the Institut de Droit Penal in Paris and the Institute of Private Law at Rome. The Institut de Droit Comparé was enlisted to study women's franchise, access to educational facilities and similar questions. The Institut de Droit Penal was assigned questions of penal and criminal laws related to women, and the Institute of Private Law focused on divorce, domicile rights and similar questions. Additionally, after much discussion, the committee agreed to employ interested women's organizations who had already been conducting studies on the legal status of women for some time. While the work was left incomplete because of the outbreak of the Second World War, the study provided a foundation upon which the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women would organize its work after 1946. The first meeting of the Committee of Experts for the Study of the Legal Status of Women Around the World was held in Geneva on 4 April 1938. They met again in January 1939 before disbanding. The members were me. Suzanne Bastet of France, Professor of Law at the University of Lyon, M. de Ruel of Belgium, Legal Advisor for the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, me. Anka Gajevic of Yugoslavia, advisor of the Yugoslav delegation at the 1930 codification conference, Mr. H. C. Gutteridge of the United Kingdom, professor of comparative law at the University of Cambridge. 
Gutteridge was elected chair of the committee, MLLE. Kirsten Hesselgren of Sweden, member of the Second Chamber of the Swedish Riksdag and Rapporteur of the Committee, Ms. Dorothy Kenyon of the United States, Doctor of Law, member of the New York Bar and legal advisor to a number of national organizations, M. Paul Sebastian of Hungary, Counselor and Head of the Treatise Division the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Mr. McKinnon Wood of the United Kingdom who served as Secretariat of the Committee. Topic. Protection of minorities The work of drawing up draft treaties for the protection of minorities in the states of Eastern Europe was entrusted with the Commission on New States set up at the Peace Conference at Paris on 1 May 1919. The ten treaties containing provisions concerning minorities I. The Treaty of 28 June 1919, between the Principal Allied and Associated Powers in Poland, signed at Versailles, 28 June 1919, in force from 10 January I-920, placed under the guarantee of the League of Nations, 13 February 1920. 2, 2. The Treaty of 10 September 1919, between the Principal Allied and Associated Powers and Czechoslovakia, placed under the guarantee of the League of Nations, 29 November 1920. 3. The Treaty of 10 September 1919, between the Principal Allied and Associated Powers and the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, placed under the guarantee of the League of Nations, 29 November 1920. IV. The Treaty of 9 December 1919, between the Principal Allied and Associated Powers and Romania, placed under the guarantee of the League of Nations, 30 August 1920. V. The Treaty of 10 August 1920, between the Principal Allied Powers and Greece signed at Neuilly sur Seine, 27 November 1919, in force from 9 August I-920. V. The Treaty of 10 August 1920, between the Principal Allied Powers and Armenia. 7. Articles 64-69 of the Treaty of Peace with Austria signed at saint germain en laye on 10 September 1919, in force from 16 July 1920, placed under the guarantee of the League of Nations, the 22 of October 1920. 8. Articles 49 to 57 of the Treaty of Peace with Bulgaria, signed at Neuilly sur Seine, the 27th of November 1919, placed under the guarantee of the League of Nations, the 22nd of October I 920. X. Articles 54 to 60 of the Treaty of Peace with Hungary, signed at Trianon on the 4th of June 1920, placed under guarantee of the League of Nations, the 30th of August 1921. X. Articles 140 to 151 of the Treaty of Peace with Turkey, signed at Sevres on the 10th of August 1920. These articles were replaced by Articles 37 to 45 of the new Treaty of Lausanne. Topic: <laughs> Finances of the League. The League of Nations was maintained financially by the member states. The Assembly controlled the annual budget. The total authorized league budgets for the four years 1921-1924 gave an average of 22,757,769 gold francs per year, equivalent to 4,391,187 American dollars. This figure covered not only the League of Nations but also the cost of the Permanent Court of International Justice and the International Labour Organization. The average share of the budget for this period was League of Nations, 2,178,445 American dollars at par. International Labour Organization, 1,350,675 American dollars. Permanent Court of International Justice, 386,000 American dollars. Topic: Final years of the League. Since the critical setbacks in 1933, the League's political cooperation became more and more ineffective. Conversely, the technical activities continued to grow. 
Thus the Council decided to evaluate the separation of technical and political activities. Committee presided by an Australian Stanley Bruce concluded that fundamental reforms were needed. However, these proposals come to an abrupt halt due to the resignation of the Secretary-General, J. Avenel, and the outbreak of the Second World War. Following the German invasion of Poland on 1 September 1939, the Secretariat prepared plans for withdrawal. The rapid advance of German armies in 1940 put pressure on the Lahn to transfer certain activities according to invitations by some government. While the Secretary-General stayed in Geneva to symbolize the League's continuity and Swiss neutrality, the main activities were located elsewhere. The High Commissioner for Refugees and the Treasury of the Secretariat were based in London, the Opium Committee was based in Washington, D.C., the Economic and Financial Organization was moved to Princeton. Neither the Assembly nor the Council could meet after December, 1939, so the rest of the League was administered by a control commission. Topic. See also Article 10 of the Covenant of the League of Nations Atlantic Charter Interwar period Latin America and the League of Nations Minority treaties Neutrality acts Palais des Nations, built as the League's headquarters League Internationale de la Paix Notes <laughs>